Thanks for listening to this Voice of San Diego podcast bonus episode. I am Scott Lewis, the CEO and Editor-in-Chief at Voice of San Diego. We have a lot of things going in your feed this week. We'll have our weekly show, of course, on Friday, as usual. Andy, Sarah, and I will go through our top news of the week. And right now, you will also see an interview Voice of San Diego Associate Editor Jesse Marks did with Olga Diaz. She's a city councilwoman in Escondido, and she is also running for the County Supervisor District 3 seat. But this episode is my interview with another candidate vying for that seat, Tara Lawson-Reamer. Lawson-Reamer is a professor and former Treasury Department advisor under Obama. Lawson-Reamer and Diaz appear to be battling for that one chance to make the runoff and face incumbent county supervisor Kristen Gaspar. Now, it could be that Diaz and Lawson-Reamer both advance to the final runoff, but it's more likely the Republican Kristen Gaspar makes it to the runoff and one of these others goes with her. And that's why this is a big race. Kristen Gaspar has a very different vision for how the county should be run and the priorities that they should have compared to Diaz or Lawson-Reamer. And if one of those, Diaz or Lawson-Reamer, beats Gaspar, it could dramatically swing the priorities of the County Board of Supervisors. Here is my chat with Tara Lawson-Reamer. You, you have been part of a political family, right? Like your father's been involved in politics. Uh, politics has always been part of your life? or I, I mean, I would say social movements and being part of social movements and public service and uh, putting the community at the, kind of the center of what uh, is meaningful and what makes life meaningful. It has always been a core family value. My... Um, we, we, I always think about my grandmother, sort of the matriarch of the family, mm-hmm. and she um, or organized in New York. Um, she taught, it was part of the freedom schools, and I kind of grew up on those stories of, um, you know, putting, putting the community above yourself um, and standing up, especially when the going's tough, standing up to fight for social justice and doing the right thing. Do you remember any particular moment when you woke up to social movements or some sort of activism, some sort of event or protest or anything? I think there's a few moments I really remember that were uh, quite formative. So the first was going to Cesar Chavez's funeral. Mm. And I had grown up um, understanding the importance of uh, farm workers' rights and growing up not eating grapes and then to have the opportunity to go to Delano to attend his funeral and see all the thousands and thousands of people whose lives he transformed uh, through the power of organizing and people coming together to to stand up for social justice and to fight for what was right and fight for fair wages for working folks. Uh, that was really, really powerful for me. Not um, eating grapes? Excuse me? What does that mean? Not eating grapes? Uh, oh, when the when there was a boycott. Correct. Okay, correct. So in the when I was a kid, there was a boycott against grapes. So we didn't eat grapes. So this is sort of part of my consciousness. And then to have been a, a little piece of that movement, just a small piece by choosing not to eat grapes in solidarity with the, uh, with the farm workers. Um, but then to be part of that feeling and that sentiment, part of the larger movement, in in Delano at the funeral was very powerful. And I I think that was really inspiring because I took that to high school and that's where I really got sort of oriented as um as an as an organizer and putting public service at the center of of what I think of as my life's work. I, the first thing I started working on was trying trying to get um, a school wide recycling program. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we also had a project trying to do something about the dumping and the st- the stormwater because I, I was in the ocean a lot and surfed, et cetera. And we we're all getting sick. So we did a lot of work to try to stop dumping um, to save the dolphins who live downstream. And took that to the next level when um, Prop 187 happened, and there was a big movement to push back against uh, these the racist policies that were coming out of Sacramento at the time. You're like 14 or something. 15? Um, so that was what was that 94? Yeah. So I was a junior. Oh. Okay. So I was uh, yeah because I, yeah, I me too. Are we the exact same age? I'm 43. Uh, no, I'm 41. Okay, sorry. I was a, I was a junior. I was a junior. Got it. Um, and I remember as a junior because I was the president of my junior class. Where at school? At La Jolla High. Oh, okay. And I actually uh, participated in this walkout, and I got kicked off from being junior class president 
because I had been part of the the walkout and and part of the protest. Um, and that was a huge learning experience that there was a pretty significant consequence or at least felt really significant to me at the time to have be get kicked off from being president of the class. The administration kicked The administration your... kicked me off. Interesting. Um, the administration kicked me off. And then there was a big um, movement of other students and my fellow students that I didn't lead. They sort of just rose up out of the woodwork, circulated a petition and started going to meet with the principal. And then they, you know, I, I had nothing to do with ma- that at all, but they felt like they had to have my back because I had had their back. Um, and so then eventually I got reinstated. They organized all these protests to get my, my job back. And then I was junior class president again um, for towards the end of the year. And so I think that was just this really powerful um, set of experiences where I recognized the importance of public policy in shaping the opportunities that people have, but also the importance of people in shaping what public policies can look like. And that we really, if we organize and if we raise our voices, we can have a voice. Where did you go to college? I went to Yale. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, what did you study? Ethics, politics, and economics. So as a triple major, it's basically f- yeah. philosophy, politics, and economics. Wow. Yeah. How was that? It's great. Um, I focused on uh, mostly on Latin America, and I did a, quite a bit on trade and development policy. And this is this was because I had in college begun to transition from my work um, doing domestic organizing. I I was organizing uh, with United Farm Workers back uh, on the East Coast. I was doing their consumer-facing organizing. Um, And I was also uh, the chair of our our, uh, American Civil Liberties Union on campus. And then I lived abroad. I lived in Ecuador uh, in my junior year and had a recognition that the problems that we face um, are really interconnected, that we're in an interconnected world and you can't think about a lot of these uh, problems in isolation, that they're systemic problems that require systemic solutions. So started working on a global trade and looking at the negative effects on workers and the environment uh, of some of these trade agreements, as well as looking at the negative effects of uh, global capital flows and um, big, big multinational corporations who were not accountable for uh, to communities and um, not accountable to the communities in which they were investing, and that that these were that these were issues that we needed to be working on everywhere. And so when I got back to uh, Yale, I both focused my academic work on how to understand these issues so I could be more prepared to bring real creative solutions to to the table. Um, But I also focused my organizing work on these issues. And I started a national uh, organization called Students Transforming and Resisting Corporations. And we had about 350 affiliates on campuses across the country, and that became a, a pretty core focus in my work for a number of years. Was this, uh, I remember in, in college, to a lot of discussion about Nike sweatshops. Yes, I was uh, very, very involved. So that was one of the uh, most exciting things I got to work on with yeah. uh, Students Transforming and Resisting Corporations with Stark, was working with uh, with USAS, which is United Students Against Sweatshops. And in fact, my, my summer job was trying to figure out how to do supply chain investigation. So how do you uh, create labor standards that are enforceable on importers and manufacturers and uh, consumer facing companies like Nike, even though the production is happening in Vietnam and China yeah. and and places where we have no jurisdiction and have no presence. So what what can we do as consumers to ensure that when Nike and other brands say that they are not using sweatshop labor, that that promise is real and that the promise is enforceable. And so my, my summer job was actually figuring out, well, how do you even have define what is a sweatshop and how do you set up monitoring systems and how do you how do you do that how do you actually fund that how do you create that kind of um, enforcement and uh, transparency even when we're talking about global supply chains how involved in actual theory did you get involved with then at that that time did you spend a lot of time thinking about um socialist theory or uh, those kind of movements or was it mostly about specific issue based things i remember I personally got involved with some of the social movements, uh, socialist movements at our college, stuff like that. Uh, spent a lot of time thinking about broader, you know, large scale reforms uh, of the entire world and the world economy. Is that something you spent time with too? 
I mean, I'll be honest, I'm a very practical person. Yeah. So, which is why I think I um, was I majored in economics, right? Is I'm, v- I'm very practical and right. I think that people and businesses res- respond to incentives. And uh, to me, the question is, what is the role in government in creating the right kind of incentives for the market to operate? What is the role of government in creating the right kind of incentives, incentives so that people make individually rational decisions that are in their own best interest, but also end up being in the public interest as well? Um, so I guess if, there, if I've been influenced theoretically, like certainly Adam Smith and the Invisible Hand, certainly that, right. that that's a pretty big theoretical influence. Um, you know, I could talk more about, you know, Hegel was a mm-hmm. big influence on me, uh, sort of looking at dialectics mm-hmm. and, ha- and the process of history as a dialectic. Um, I was I definitely very, uh, very influenced by, um, by Rousseau. Uh, that was an important theorist for me. And then um, more recently, and someone who became the two people who really became sort of the linchpins of my own political philosophy uh, is Amartya Sen and John Rawls. So I don't know how familiar you are with those political no. theorists, but uh, John Rawls, Theory of Justice, uh, extraordinary monumental work, um, highly recommended to everyone. And Amartya Sen, uh, um, Development of, as Freedom, uh, equally you know, monumental work. And uh, Amartya Sen actually won. Nobel Prize in economics for his work on welfare theory. And uh, those two together, um, they don't they don't come from they don't come at this issues from the same um, core premises, but they arrive at relatively uh, similar theoretical frameworks. I could talk all day about John Rawls, but mm-hmm. though if I'm if I was to identify sort of lodestars of my um, my ethical uh, and uh, theoretical orientation, it's it's Amart Issen and John Rawls. Okay. You go to law school after that? Yes. Well, no, I was or I was running Stark, so I was an right. organizer. I was run, I was organizing for. Oh wow! Stark. How big had it gotten at that it's point? It's big. So, um, we had, like I said, we had three hundred and fifty affiliates, and uh, it was very. I mean, it was a way. It was really ragtag, right? At students, but it was really powerful. Um, we brought thousands of students to Washington, um, and then to to protest against the IMF and the World mm-hmm. Bank. Uh, that was around the time too, the the Seattle protests. And I was happened. in Seattle, so we brought about a thousand people to Seattle. Oh wow! And um, that was a very transformative moment for me. Uh, a funny story on Seattle is I was part of organizing the folks in the streets to demand better, more accountable, more transparent, more democratic global trade deals. And Lael Brainerd uh, was a young White House staffer in the Clinton administration working for um, the Council on Economic Advisors. And she was part of the negotiating team for um, the uh, for the United States at the WTO. Um, but she was and she was the woman who I worked for when I worked yeah. in the uh, Obama administration. And so Lael's a wonderful, wonderful woman and brilliant. And uh, it was it was always a little bit of a joke because she would would tease me about the fact that I had been out in the streets and she'd been in the middle of the meetings. Um, but then we ended up working together while I was working for her, uh, working for Obama. Fascinating. Hey, you know, we'll talk about current issues soon. I want to still go through the biography, but as we look at this national discussion right now about global trade, about uh, the restructured NAFTA agreement, I mean, that was part of my activism in college too, was was frustration with that. There was, uh, and then there's this discussion about Pacific trade agreements, and, and there was a distinctly right-wing response, nationalistic response to it, and then there's always been this distinctly labor, uh, environmental, left response to it. How do you look at these international trade discussions now with that, with the benefit of this, like, you know, deep activism that you were involved with? I wish I could send you the uh, the report I just did for the Open Society Foundation, yeah. trying to help them think about what their orientation should be, their policy orientation should be towards global trade agreements um, with a specific focus on environmental issues and workers' issues in the global economy and human rights. Um, so... That's a very complicated question. I don't want to spend our entire interview sure. about the County Board of Supervisors talking about global trade deals. But um, I think the core, for me, the core question is how do you create frameworks? How do you create laws that if corporations are sort of left to, to, to do what they do, which is to try to, you know, make money and create products that are good for consumers, that the 
externalities that the, that there's the ill effects that there's not ill effects that there's positive effects not negative effects on on society as a whole mm-hmm. um so i think there's a couple big things um one is about the environment is about protecting the environment ensuring that you can't have a race to the bottom that you're not able to uh produce products more cheaply by cutting corners on in ways that really really un- impact all of us negatively and you know hurt our oceans and end up with more pollution and more carbon emissions in the in you know greenhouse gas uh so all of that those questions around race to the bottom and environment um i think are have been a huge problem, have not been adequately addressed, and I have to be prioritized at, when we think about global trade agreements. And then likewise on workers' protections and workers' rights. And uh, some of the conditions in factories can be absolutely, I mean, they're, it's appalling. I mean, people are, you, uh, people are locked up in rooms and forced to work 18-hour days, and there's fires and people die. Yeah. And these are conditions that we confronted <laughs> as a society uh, in the United States in the turn of the century. And anyone who remembers sort of movement history will remember, you know, the triangle Absolutely. shirt race fire fire. Right. And right. That, that this was a moment where there were literally like women jumping to their deaths, you know, eight stories, 10 stories in New York dying on the sidewalk, jumping from windows because they were locked in the room and they couldn't get out of the room and a fire came and then they they couldn't get out and get through the fire escape and these conditions happening are happening worldwide and we're facilitating them um and then we're we're allowing products to be sold more cheaply here um at the cost of human lives and human sufferings and at the same time undermining our own economy and good paying jobs domestically uh, so those are i think those issues you know making sure that the the way we structure these deals um, creates opportunities that are shared and widely shared and protects our environment for future generations and pushes us in a direction of sustainable development is, is what's really critical. And I don't want to spend much time on the details, but yeah. Well, I, I don't either, except that I think it does give a uh, you know window into your theories and thinking. And I think you know that locally, the renegotiated NAFTA, the USMCA, is uh, you know, a big economic issue the chamber of commerce very excited about the deal we have local representatives that will have to take a final stand on that do you think they should approve it i'll be really honest i'm focused on the county right now so i have not read it and i will not have an opinion on that unless i read it i read um the entire three thousand pages of the trans-pacific partnership so that's this is a yeah the the devils are in the details and how these whether who who wins and who loses in these deals and I'm not going to have an opinion if I haven't read the fair the enough text. all right um, okay let's talk let's I want to get through the legal career so you did go to law school yeah so just to back up so sure. after um, I was working with Stark and then the war in Iraq started. Oh, wow. And we tried to stop it. So we organized a lot of students. I was part of the leadership committee uh, to bring about 100,000 people to Washington to try to stop the war in Iraq and um, engage in you know, a lot of organizing work to try to, to, try to uh, halt that, uh, frankly, immoral war that was ill-conceived and poorly executed. Um, and I actually feel quite vindicated by history. Yeah. You know, very sadly, I wish I had been I wrong. I remember giant protests in New York and D.C., every the, major city. The, right? Well, yeah. So my organization, that's what we did. We we were the seat. We, we basically organized all these protests all over the country to try to stop the war. And then um, and then we had a big one in Washington. And we failed. So I figured that um, I needed more tools in the toolbox to try to help uh, create and fight for the world that I thought we needed to be living in. I was an organizer and I felt like clearly I hadn't succeeded in stopping the war um, in Iraq. And so I needed uh, more skills to to be able to um, not just win power, but to know what I did with it, what to do with it when you do have it. And to be able to make the right decisions and smart decisions and wise decisions and good decisions. So I decided to go back to school and I uh, went to get my PhD in political economy and also my law degree. And I was doing that sort of simultaneously, one year one thing, one year the other. Wow. Where was that? At uh, NYU, at New York University. Yeah. Yeah. And did you get those skills? Yeah, I think so. Definitely, actually. And what did you do with them? Well, I've I've had just a lot of opportunities to give back. I'm not 
that they just fell in my lap. I mean, sure. a lot of uh, f- a lot of struggle to to kind of create those opportunities. Um, but I think if you go out there and you knock on enough doors and you put yourself out there and you say that you have something to offer, and um, you're willing to really hustle and really do the work, eventually people s- do see that you have good ideas and you have a good work ethic and you work hard. And I think that's been my story: is just working really hard and um, just showing up and showing up and showing up and. Uh, showing that I, I I bring something to the table. Um, so the I think the the work I'm the most proud of is the work I did in the Obama administration, and that was a great opportunity to to be able to bring my legal training, bring my economics training, bring my background as an organizer uh, to the table, and uh, try to drive forward agendas at the Treasury Department that were frankly, very new and very different for Treasury. Um, it was the Obama administration, which there was a lot of openness to um, a human rights-based approach and uh, an approach to economic policy that was inclusive and sustainable and about putting communities first and putting people first and and um, safeguarding our environment for future generations. But at the same time, it was the Treasury Department. So uh, that's not the place that um, is usually sort of the hotbed of thinking uh, or forward thinking on these issues, which was a which was great because it's also the place that has the most power over a lot of the things that I think are so in- important in in our economy. Um, and so, so, what to, kind of things did you put forward? Uh, so, I did a lot of work again on the trade issues mm-hmm. um, and, and alternatives to that. Um, a huge amount of my work was fo- focused on um, how to cut pollution and better regulate extractive industries, mining and uh, oil companies. Um, I mostly got into this looking at the pollution issues and some of those negative effects in, on the environment, but there's also a lot of negative political effects as well. And when you look at, uh, de- at developing countries, you see many of the countries that are very resource dependent um, are also very corrupt. And this is a, a phenomenon called the resource curse. And so did a lot of work trying to figure out how do we how do we deal with this? How do we deal with the fact that, you know, Equatorial Guinea has one of the highest per capita incomes in the world because of its its, its oil wealth and has one of the absolutely most abysmally low uh, levels of any kind of human indicator, you know, hugely, hugely high infant mortality rates, no access to sanitation. So these are the kinds of issues that you see surface in addition to massive, massive degradation of our natural resources, huge amounts of dumping, oil spills. Um, So trying to figure out how to tackle those issues domestically, but uh, in a global economy, because we're we're really talking about global resources Mm -hmm. and how do the, how do these, how do we regulate in the global context? That seems more of like an environmental protection agency issue or something. What is the treasury department? Oh, it's everything. So, um, Gosh, it's just basically like, okay, so let's, I'll give one example. Um, So the World Bank, uh, it has loans billions of dollars, like billions and billions of dollars for all sorts of investment projects. They have rules on what are called, these are these environmental safeguards. So what kind of projects are allowed to get money? Mm -hmm. Um, How do you monitor what the impacts of these projects are? How do you ensure that the projects once you loan money to them, don't have uh, negative environmental impacts or negative social impacts. Those, all those environmental policies from the World Bank are set by the tre- the U.S. set through the U.S. Treasury. So the U.S. Treasury oh. ha- owns our voting seat on the World Bank. So all think about like, and it's not just the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. We also govern their lending practices. The Treasury Department does, and so it impacts all these kinds. What kind of projects get invested in? Um, what kind of projects have safeguards? What would those safeguards look like? Uh, there's Latin American development banks, the United Nations. So there's all these ways in which projects get funded around the world, including in our own country, um, that are that are determined by the rules set by the global financial institutions. They're called the, the IFIs, the International Financial Institutions. And uh, the Environmental Protection Agency does really, really important work, but it's um, – it's totally domestically focused, right? There's right. no, there's no jurisdiction of the EPA outside of the U.S. Wow. So, what brought you back to San Diego? Uh, well, Barbara, well, first of all, I'm from San Diego, yeah. and I love home, and I always had intended to come back, and I just, you, you, I've had this life of being dedicated to trying to figure out how I can use my skills and abilities to make the most possible impact and to make the biggest difference and to really give back 
because that's so core to my values. And so that those were the opportunities that unfolded for me was in, uh, you know, I got a full ride to law school and that was in New York and I got a full ride for my PhD and those were merit scholarships. So I, of course, took that and stayed. And then I um, was hired as a professor at and loved teaching. And that was in New York. And you, it's really hard to de- uh, have much to say over mm-hmm. where you get hired as a professor. And then you don't you don't say no to when right. you have an opportunity to go work, be work as a senior advisor in your hero. in <laughs> Like Obama is my hero in his administration. And so those were just great opportunities. But this was home. It's mm-hmm. always been home. I mean, not just home for me, but I'm a third generation San Diegan. Um, my, my grandpa was stationed at Camp Pendleton and my mom grew up in Vista and Oceanside. So I always knew that I would be back here Mm -hmm. and it just took a while for me to figure out how to get back. And I was really excited to be able to come home again. Um, And then I was glad I was here when when Trump won because that gave me an opportunity. I, I live in the 49th Congressional District and it gave me an opportunity to think in the entire world, if there's one thing I can do to fight back against hatred and bigotry and fight back against what I see going on in Washington, it's to flip the 49th because it was the closest race in the country. And that was my home district. And I knew that we were facing an off cycle election and unlikely to win, but there was such an upsurge and up such an outswell of energy that if we could just figure out how to channel people's anger and to fear to something productive and community building and concrete and practical, we would be able to win that district. And so I think it was really fortunate that I, I was there because I had the opportunity to, to help make that happen. To work on something right away. So it, it didn't actually work the first time, right? Uh, I saw one re-election in 16. Well, I wasn't, no. I mean, we, I'm not. Oh, 18, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah I yeah. was. That's what I'm saying. It's like okay. we didn't think that there was anything in play in 16. I thought we were going right. to have a Hillary Clinton right. White House. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so, yeah. The um, last four years are confusing still. Um, yeah. we're, I, we really didn't. I actually, it was pretty astonishing. Um, people just came out of the wood, woodwork. And, and Yeah. So you, you were part of the group Flip the 49th Neighbors in Action, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. did you lead that, create yeah. it? Okay. Yeah. So there was another one. Another flip the, flip the 49th? Okay. No. Okay. One flip the 49th. One group called flip the 49th. Got yes. it. I was the treasurer. Treasurer. To be specific. Yes. Okay. And so um, you, you, one of the, the fundraising emails you put out was, was interesting. I just wanted to ask you about it. You said, we trained hundreds of volunteers focused on long-term organizing capacity and a progressive in- infrastructure that can work on other issues. It's time we bring that movement to flip the District 3. So is there's a that that's a positive you creating in as in 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 progressive politics that you're creating a group of people who are working long term that can also be read cynically that now that that effort you put together is now your infrastructure for this campaign is that a fair assessment? I wish that was true. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very nice. Um, so we're going to get into the weeds a little bit, but that was an IE. It was a five twenty seven. So when I it's it's an independent expenditure campaign. Um, there's lots of them, but right. ours is just special because it was a volunteer-led independent expenditure. Yeah, campaign. and it did a lot of like door knocking. Door knocking. Like yeah, that, I mean, which we, isn't necessarily common for IEs. Right? Never, never right. do it. They never do it. It's uh, because it's hard to organize people, and so IEs just usually spend money on you know mail and social media. But we ran. It was all we did was organize people. So that was an IE effort and um, it succeeded in getting Mike Levin elected. I have a campaign. Um, so actually, unfortunately for me, a lot of that infrastructure is things I couldn't build on. Okay. Um, and I had to leave it behind. Okay. Yeah. Did you support Mike Levin from the beginning? I did not. I mean, Flip in was really, really... Uh, very clear from day one that we had one goal and it was to flip the 49th and we would support any Democrat that made it through. And we became, I I don't know if you recall, but it was actually the, the race was rather toxic from the, in terms of the infighting within the party. And we were definitely the place that uh, people who had different candidates and in the fight 
could come and work together and find common ground. Oh, that's interesting. Like yeah. a refuge. Like it was absolutely. It was the it was the space where everyone was welcome, um, and there was a, a space for everyone to come and work together. Is there a lesson in that that maybe every one of these contested primaries should have sort of a a, a refuge like that? I don't know. I mean, it's hard to draw specific lessons from the moment that we faced because it was really special that there were so many people who had never been politically activated or politically involved who all of a sudden wanted to be. And what we wanted to do was provide a, a, a way for them to do that in a it, that would be impactful and effective. And I think we did. You know, what's really exciting is that um, I have nothing to do with FLIP anymore. It's a uh, now is two groups. Um, one is a group called Neighbors in Action working locally on a lot of local issues. And uh, and another group is Keep the 49th. And it's about mm. um, doing similar work to make sure we don't lose the 49th in 2020. They're the actually many of the same volunteers and many of the same people, but sort of two different focuses. And that's great. You know, I think it's incredible. It's one of the things you... I uh, learn as an organizer, you think about as an organizer, is that you know your job is done when you're not needed anymore. Um, so, yeah. I, yeah. Let me ask you about North County. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's a really interesting place. We've tried to wrap our arms around it for a long time. Is it's very diverse. There's there's coastal. There's uh, Oceanside is very different from Encinitas. Um, you know, Escondido is very different from either. It's a and and there's all kinds of demographic differences and such. What did you, what do you feel like the 49th campaign taught you about North County? What is it? What is it like? It's very there's very conservative parts of it. There's there's obviously very liberal. There's there's that coastal, you know, very mm-hmm. protective, uh, but also very progressive. I, I I find it fascinating. What did you learn? Well, I'm happy to answer your question, but I do think it's important to put out there, especially for your listeners, that my race isn't really. North County. Okay. It's a, a pretty big misconception. Sure. So the district that I'm running for and the Board of Supervisors in District 3, it starts in Encinitas and it goes down the coast. So we're looking at Encinitas, Solana Beach, Del Mar. Right. And then it cuts across between the 56 and the 52. So we're in Carmel Valley, Sereno Valley, right. uh, University City. And then we're, we're all the way in Scripps Ranch. And then we're down in Tierra Santa. And then we're up the 15 and we're in Rancho Bernardo and Rancho Penasquitos and Forest Ranch and all the way up to Escondido. Yeah. So that is a d- very different demographic, very different district um, than, than the, the 49th. 49th. And right. what's been great is I've now had the opportunity to run a campaign in the 49th and run a campaign in D3 right in quick succession. So I've had this, that's, I can see a lot of the similarities um, because there certainly are big overlapping areas, um, but also see a lot of the differences. And I, I love it. Like I think, I think San Diego is just a wonderful place because of our diversity. Mm-hmm. We are the eighth largest metropolitan region in the country. This is where uh, I think a lot of folks don't quite understand why the Board of Supervisors is such a big job and so such an important job for our region. It's not um, – we're not like a podunk set of small towns anymore, right? Mm-hmm. We are the eighth largest metropolitan region in the country, and that's really captured in that diversity in the fact that you have all different kinds of communities, um, different kinds of people. Um, the So it's hard to generalize, but I think yeah. that, that that was a very – uh, interesting experience um, getting to talk to people in in all of these different communities. My aunt lives in Vista, and like I said, my mom grew up in Oceanside, and but I grew up in you know further south and actually more in Mission Hills. So I've had sort of a, a spanning sure. of the of the whole county and got to draw on a, a lot of those relationships. So last week there was a really interesting uh, event in Encinitas. I find Encinitas fas- fascinating in the sense- You know, I live there. Yes. Okay. So that's why I wanted to ask you about this. So I love Encinitas. I adore it. We go there every year. We spend time camping and and then we walk around town. And, um, and, and then there was this event last week. It was about this safe parking lot in uh, on the Leash Tech Foundation's yes. uh, land, the old Palecki Ranch. And I've been up there- um, I and they've you know they basically made a deal with uh, Jewish Family Services that they could manage on this lot about a spot for about twenty five people to s- safely park their cars overnight, and uh, the city has to be involved I guess to lease the land um, in a basic way, 
uh, for a dollar or something. And this is, this has made it a city issue. And, um, there was this event last week, we had a reporter there and I was kind of disturbed by the rhetoric that I'd heard about it and, and what was captured from it. A, a tremendous amount of fear and anger about the, the lot. Um, and I feel like Encinitas has kind of become a, a real hot spot for all of the issues that we're dealing with, with housing, transportation, homelessness, in the sense of uh, it feels like it, it, it has a there's, a, there's a sort of concentration of discussion about it in Encinitas often. And I'm curious how you read that, because so many of the, the residents can be very um, progressive or, or Democrat or, you know, um, liberal, but then also there's a very intense worry about the character of the community being lost. Um, how is that going to resolve itself, do you think? Do you think uh, it, is, uh, it is bad or it's just a bunch of people trying to handle uh, uh, some pretty gnarly questions? Your question is huge. Right. Because it's about Encinitas' care, the character of Encinitas, um, but it's also about the what's going on with the safe parking right. issue. So which which of that what of that do you want me to bet off first? Well, let's talk let's start with the safe parking. Do you think it's an okay plan? I think it's an okay plan. Actually I have a petition that I just accidentally started one night because I was very distraught by the rhetoric. Okay. Um, and it has it just sent it to a couple friends and then all of a sudden it had was has a few hundred signatures. Um, one of the council members texted me today saying, I saw your petition. Thank you so much for, uh, for making this happen. I didn't really even realize people were signing it because I was so busy on the campaign. Uh, I just made it as a favor. Um, so I'm upset about the rhetoric. I think that it's really important to uh, create a space in our community for, um, people who are down on their luck to have an opportunity to get back on their feet. Um, that's part of what being in a society is all about, right? That uh, we all have bad luck. Um, and the purpose of, of we don't throw each other to the wolves, right? Like we're not Spartans. You don't like mm -hmm. get sent to the, to the mines when you're, you know, a, a child because you, you know, you mm -hmm. don't live up to some perfect standard, right? We, I think we have, we have much, much uh, better values where, uh, people have a chance to to have a second chance and a third chance and that there's some basic human rights that need to be respected. And um, I, so I think the safe parking program is a good idea in that regard. I, it's also clearly not a solution and it, nobody thinks it's a solution. It's not a long-term solution. I mean, people need homes and they need a path to, ha to, to housing, to permanent housing. Um, but certainly it's a good temporary solution. And a lot of people have said, well, it's just a Band-Aid. We don't need a Band-Aid. Well, let me tell you, I'm a trained EMT. I take kids backpacking and I'm really happy I have Band-Aids when they're bleeding. It's not a solution, but you, you sometimes you need a Band-Aid. Yeah. And that's really important to have them. Um, but even just beyond, bigger than that, um, as a resident, I, I live near Moonlight Beach. And even in a self-interested way, even if you're, you're not committed in the way that I am to an ethical um, and moral obligation to care for our, our fellow humans and our, um, in our society, I don't really want people showering in the bathrooms at Moonlight Beach mm -hmm. where I live, right? I don't want people there who don't have anywhere else to get clean going into our beach bathrooms and using them as to bathe and my, my infant and it, it's not, that's not a good environment for either for me either. So I actually think there's a way in which people haven't recognized that like we do have homeless, we need to create services for them. And if we don't, uh, there's actually a negative effect on residents. And I'm a resident who has felt those negative effects. Yeah. It feels like we're constantly in this like cycle of rhetoric where you'd say that and you'd say we should build more facilities that where they could actually shower or a place where they could actually live and then the response is always, well, uh, you're just going to attract more people. It's like some sort of induced demand of, of homeless services. And uh, how do we break that cycle? Is that, is that something do you, that you think needs to be broken? Should we break the cycle of homelessness? Is that the question? Of, no, of this, <laughs> of this rhetoric that, that leads people to conclude that if you do anything for them, you're only incentivizing somehow a growth of them, some, some sort of population growth of homeless people who are coming. I mean, one of the arguments that seems most prevalent in the, in the safe parking lot was this idea that you're going to just 
attract more people from outside Encinitas to come and be there. And this, well, this is where I think my background in global trade comes in handy, right? Because it's this, this is very similar argument, which is if you want, if you have one unit of government or one neighborhood acting unilaterally, you could get a race to the bottom. You actually need to have like lots of services being offered across the county um, so that you don't end up creating mm-hmm. only one. If there's only one place that has services, then of course people who need services are going to go to that one place that has services. Right. That's reasonable on behalf of the, the, the people who need the services. I would too, right? If I needed services, I would go to the place that had services. Very reasonable. Um so the answer is that we need more places that have services so that you don't have you don't create like a locus or a, a concentration. Um, and I think this is one of the mo- most important things that I can do on the county board, which is to be able to be a good partner and to facilitate and broker those kinds of shared collective solutions where you're not need you're not asking one neighborhood or one municipality to 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 take all the burden or act unilaterally. You're saying, look, we're going to help all across the board. We're going to find the solutions that make sense in, in multiple communities. So you're not getting just concentrations in one community. Um, but also I think the other piece of this is frankly, we need to be doing a lot better job up front of preventing uh, folks from, from getting that situation in the first place. And if they are in that situation of doing what we need to get them out of that situation quickly um, and not just saying, well, we, people are going to be permanently homeless. Like we need to be confronting our affordability, our housing affordability issues so that people aren't forced out onto the streets and sleeping in their cars because they can't afford rent. And we also need to be providing wraparound services when you do have housing for solutions so that folks can actually get the services they need to get out of those shelters. And right now we're, we're not doing enough of either. Do you think there is a housing shortage in District 3 of the county? I think there is a housing shortage of certain kinds of house, housing across the entire district of the entire, across the entire county of San Diego. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you look at our building numbers, we we are far exceeding our RENA targets, our our state mandated targets on building for 150 percent of median income and above. We're great if you make 150 percent of median income and above, you're you're in good shape. Um, we're doing fairly badly, but not uh, horrifically for our affordable housing, which is people who are, I think it's below 50% or below of median income. Not good, but not horrific. The real gap are folks from 50% to 120% of median income. A lot of times people don't think of this as, quote, affordable housing, right? Because uh, the, usually the technical definition are people who are in poverty and are you know 50% below or below of median income. These are folks who are making the average average wage, households that are doing pretty well in San Diego, but there's no homes for them. And we definitely have a shortage, um, a pretty dramatic shortage of housing for folks at that uh, income level across the county. Mm-hmm. And do you think the market can address that if there's spots opened up for them? Can the market address that? I think it's a little bit of a, sorry, Scott, I'll say it's a little a bit of a silly question because uh, if the market could address it without um, some assistance, the market would have addressed it. Well, except that there's so few spots. I mean, a place but like that's the whole. The, but that's what I'm saying. Like the market can't address something. If it's not allowed to. Yes, exactly. And so I think what we're, what, what I, I, the way I look at the housing issue is that we have to, um, create the conditions for housing to be built at a reasonable price in the right places. What are the right places? Certainly it should be close to where people work or closer to where people work. So we're not contributing to long commutes. I mean, I don't want to sit in my car for an hour and a half. I don't think anyone does. So we need to be building closer to where people work. It's also important to be build close to where people work because of our carbon emissions comes from cars idling in traffic. So I care deeply about climate change. It's one of my number one policy priorities. We're never going to address climate change if we continue having these long commutes. We have to we have to cut those commute distances and commute times down. So we need to build near where people work. We also need to build where we have transit hubs. Unfortunately, and I've said this many times, we don't actually really have transit hubs in most of North County. I think we could get there with some thoughtful investments. Um, but we're not there now. I live near the train um, and I did not take the train here. Mm-hmm. I would like to have taken the train here. Uh, unfortunately, 
last uh, time I took the train downtown for a meeting, um, I got stuck because the coaster uh, ended and I hadn't finished my meeting yet and I was stuck in down in I think I was stuck in Little Italy. So this is clearly not a reasonable solution. It's for, not functioning. No, for it's not functioning. Yeah. Um, so we need to build near transit, but we don't really have transit. So we also need to be investing in transit so we actually have transit hubs. Uh, but the third thing that we need to think about is what's the impact on the community? Uh, you can't just build homes without thinking about traffic and congestion and parks and schools. One of the biggest challenges is when you, you build in a place and then all of a sudden the schools overrun because you haven't thought carefully about uh, increasing school age population or you build in a place and now um, there's, everyone is stuck in traffic because nobody's thought carefully about uh, transit solutions for, for that kind of density. So that needs to be dealt with up front and dealt with ahead of time. And one of the things I think I find most um, most challenging or most problematic is when we, when we uh, argue that the solutions all be solved just by upzoning, right? If you just say, oh, you're just going to like allow more units, then suddenly you're going to get affordable housing. No, you're going to get more housing. They won't necessarily be affordable units, right? You're going to get more units. They won't, they, there's no reason to think that they're going to be affordable. And in fact, I would argue that if you look historically, uh, especially in places that are, you know, have our higher income locations, if you don't have a pretty thoughtful uh, regulatory environments to ensure that those how those units become affordable, they won't be it, because the market will allow them to be sold at a pretty high rate and they'll become luxury condos. So I think that we need to see the kind of leadership where um, if we're going to allow for upzoning, um, we need to do something which I'm calling um, regulatory giving. Yeah. So I don't know if you've heard of a regulatory taking, yeah. right? But Basically, if we're going to upzone and it, some a unit goes from having a, a parcel goes from being zoned for one unit to now being zoned for 20 units, there's now 19 additional units of value that yeah. have been generated. That should not just be a windfall to have whatever lucky property owner that owns that parcel sure. with the cost imposed on all the rest of us, yeah. right? That needs to be recaptured. And you can re, if you could if we can recapture that value and recapture the value of that, of that upzoning, then we can use that to, you know, subsidize affordable housing, to, to mandate the housing is affordable, to mandate uh, pretty significant inclusionary housing uh, requirements, to take care of our transit investments, to, you know, make sure that we're really addressing these externalities that are imposed on the community so you're not getting a really uh, radical misdistribution of resources. Yeah. That that argument is often used though by people who are trying to protect their communities as as sometimes as a a red herring in the sense of you know well it's not actually going to be affordable housing well sometimes you create a, a housing opportunity for somebody at a higher income in 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 Encinitas and somebody in University City might move into it and then that spot in University City is open and then somebody in North Park might be able to move into that. And you create uh, affordable opportunities down uh, the ladder. It's not a trickle down necessarily, but it's a layering concept that isn't all that unfamiliar. If you only create, if you, if you, any house that you create uh, is going to free up more space for people. So who, I'm just not, I don't buy this argument in the, in the, that, that if you just have more supply, I mean, it's a very simple arc. It's a very simplistic argument. It's not that, that like some more supply is going to, therefore, uh, you're going to move your supply curve. And so you're going to have a, an intersection of your supply and demand curve at a lower market price. Like I can, like, I can see the curves, right? I can see the graphs in my head. But that it ignores all sorts of things. Like one, it ignores the fact that actually markets are really sticky in real estate, extremely sticky. Downward prices are are um, not very frequent, especially in rental markets. Uh, second of all, it ignores the fact that you're not going to sell for um, less than the cost of production, and the cost of production is pretty high. If you, especially if you include the value of land inputs, um, so that is. I mean, I think we're better off saying, okay, how do we reduce the cost of construction if we're yeah. if we're trying to figure out how to make homes more affordable it's not just that we can't just say like let's just build more homes but that's a we scary to- that's a scary point though because right now when you look at the amount of literally regulated affordable housing that's being created or even envisioned to be created it's still just a tiny tiny 100%. drop in the bucket i mean it's just it's just it's this much it's nothing i'm it's holding nothing. my 
And yeah. so, so I get scared when people say the market can't deal with it, but we're also only going to create this much. Like it feels like that's just that's a, an answer that we cannot get out of this problem because if we can't get out of this problem, then there are enormous consequences for our education, for for our economy, for for our, well, for let our me, own so, kids. So let me just, I mean, I think, and maybe this goes to a lot about how I think about the role of government, right? I don't believe that markets operate without government, right? No, that, that's not. just not how it works, right? Governments create conditions under which markets operate. And so when you say, can the market solve the problem? I say, no, not on its own. Right. We need government leadership. And I think there's lots of ways and lots of tools that we have to look at in order to bring government leadership. Um, one is figuring out how to ensure that the uh, the benefits of upzoning don't just go to one right. or a few individuals. That the that the that 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 is appropriately shared as a public good um, and not captured by a few individuals. So that can be used for reinvestments in affordability, in affordable housing, in infrastructure, in schools. There's a, there's I think lots and lots of other tools we're going to have to look at. I think I'd like to see. Um, the possibility of, public, of a public bank and exploring a public bank because I think one of the things that we could do is make the cost of capital lower, mm -hmm. reduce the cost of capital. If we can reduce the cost of capital um, and put... Just to be clear, a public bank is a concept approved by the legislature for mm -hmm. local places to pursue, which would be a, um, you know, instead of going to Wall Street to borrow money to build a road or a building or a fire station or something. Or you could, you, a housing development. You could go yeah. to this bank that's more incorporated as a, as a, as a, as an agency and would have ostensibly lower fees, if any, to borrow, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think we, you would want to make um, preferential loan, um, preferential loan rates available for uh, borrowers who are willing to, you know, Put a set aside higher levels of inclusionary housing in the units that they're building, you know, or you know, put some kind of uh, constraints to ensure that that they're not sold, they, that you can't borrow cheaply and then just uh, sell high in the market, right? That they, that that would be passed through to sure. the consumer in the end. Um, I'd also I also think that there's we can do a lot more of um, putting in place pre-approved plans that are standardized so that we can really expedite the approval process. That's a huge problem. You know, if you want to get, if you want to build, even if you want to build like an ADU, this is not that easy. Yeah. There's a lot of hoops to jump. And the ADU is an accessory, accessory, accessory dwelling, dwelling unit, uh, yep. granny flat. Yeah, yeah. And I think we can do a lot <laughs> more on putting and having those kinds of models so that we have a much, much quicker, almost, you know, like cookie cutter type of uh, approval process. Uh, and I think looking at the regulatory framework, looking at uh, how do you reduce the cost of capital uh, and looking at ensuring that when you do upzone, that the value is used to reinvest to make sure that you have the amenities you need for that to actually be functional community are three of the most important things that we're going to need to be doing. I am not, I am definitely not of the belief that the affordable housing problem is going to be solved by government of building a few number of affordable housing units. That is not viable. It is not the solution. But what we do need is the government to take a much more active role in shaping the incentives faced by market actors, face, shaping the, the what we're looking at in the housing market so that individually rational investors are sort of pushed like Adam Smith's invisible yeah. hand to do what will will lead to more affordable housing units. You mentioned that you uh, want to uh, invest and repair and, and support public transit. Um, there's a really interesting discussion led by the person you want to get out of office, uh, Kristen Gasper, not led, but she's a part of a resistance that's sort of building in some of these areas uh, against a push at the San Diego Association of Governments to do a radical overhaul of our transit system to perhaps invest tens of billions of dollars if we if if the vision comes together to make a system that would actually work that you could use to get downtown for a meeting and then back up to your home uh, one of the interesting points uh, Sandag Sasana Krata has made is uh, I, I think if he had a magic wand he would get rid of the sprinter uh, the along the 78 corridor in in North County because it doesn't serve people along actual, living routes and, and such that he would want a heavy rail uh, corridor um, 
roads and, and other things tied into this actual, maybe even a subway system that could serve these areas. Uh, he's thinking, in other words, extremely big about um, major public investment in, in transit that might actually serve uh, and be useful to people in their homes. Is that kind of overhaul something you could get on board for? So first of all, I want to give um, Chris and Gaspar as a political consultant, Jason Rowe, a lot of credit for uh, <laughs> getting uh, putting out red bait for everyone that everyone uh, chased it and took the bait. Um, I think it's a complete misframing and mischaracterization of the issue, right? So uh, let's just back up. To me, this is not a question of roads versus do we invest in roads or do we invest in public transit and mass transit? Um, I think it's it's both and, and it's a question of where and sequencing um, because we have very diverse communities in San Diego. And so I'm interested in how do we get folks from point A to point B in the way that is most efficient, most comfortable, most pleasant as possible for them. And that is not going to be the same for someone who lives um, in Rancho Santa Fe as it is for someone who lives in Normal Heights. It's just not, right? You would live in completely different kinds of communities. And that's fine. That's what part of what makes San Diego such a wonderful place. So let's begin with the fact that we have diverse communities. It's not an either or. And even Hassan it has never come out and said we shouldn't invest anything in roads. No, like, he hasn't. But and- he has said that for public transit to work, it has to it has to be much different than it is. And that I might- would agree with that. But to me that I but I, and I don't I've not met a single person who disagrees with that. Everyone agrees that if for public transit to work it needs to be much different than it is. But the question I have though is the the investment that would that would take, which I think I would be interested in talking about, but I'm not sure whether you would. Would you be interested in a plan that would require literally tens of billions of dollars to to overhaul to make useful for people in your community. I'm very interested in having that conversation. I think what I'm saying is that there has been um, an effort by Kristen Gaspar to frame it as if you if you like yes. uh, pu- mass transit or you think there's possibilities there, then somehow you're against roads. Not true. We absolutely have to invest in our roads. We have to repair our roads. We have to maintain our roads. And we also need to look at massive investments in public transit and mass transit where it makes sense to do so. I do not see these as either or. I see well, them as both is- and. And let me, to to continue this, what I think is most interesting, like if you sit down and you talk to Hassan, you know, he, sa- he, he says, he's like, look, we need to get 10% of the people out of their cars and then nobody's sitting in traffic. 90% of people can, should will probably for the foreseeable future be in their cars. The goal is not to get 100% or 50% or even 40 to 20% of people out of their cars because that's not the way Sandy was built. It's not the way we're built. He doesn't think so. That's not even part of his vision. His vision is how do we create a system that is good enough is transformative enough for the te- for ten percent of people because that's good for all the other ninety percent of people who are in their cars, mm-hmm. and that's why I'm saying that I'm kind of sick of this. Uh, like, uh, I, I really think that again, I give Jason real credit for like creating this either, either or, and it's not like Hassan has not come out and said we shouldn't we should ignore well, people who no, are in their he, cars. He said we need to create systems that work for people so that some of them use those systems, which is better for everyone else I agree, who's left on the roads. I, I agree. And I agree that it's not an either or, except that resources are capped right now. Like there has to be choices right now about specific amounts of money that are available for specific investments and the list of investments that you might have to sacrifice to support other things. And but so, but where that's not even where the conversation is. I no, mean, I that, understand. I, that's why I think that the, that what we're doing right now is actually the, exactly right, which is we're doing a study. And yeah. I mean, of course, I will think that, right? Because I'm a yeah. researcher, I'm a social scientist, so I'm very empirically driven, and I always am data driven. I'm always interested in what are the answers that the data tells us the right answers. I don't think you can have a prior. You can't walk in to say this and say we need we need a road here or we need a subway there. I don't know. We need a study. We're having a study. It's great that we're having a study. And the idea that the end result of the study is that you need either only a subway or only a road is like totally politics run amok without 
paying any attention to what like an actual study is likely to produce, which is going to be like pretty nuanced and have a whole bunch of different intersecting uh, recommendations that we're going to then have to say, okay, what's the price tag on this? Maybe it's bigger than we can handle. And then you can start looking at specifics. Right. One of the things Hassan said was that we should perhaps get rid of the North County Transit District and merge it with the Metropolitan Transit System. Is that something you'd be interested in? Um, I have to be honest. I don't feel like I have enough um, understanding of the pathologies of our various transit systems to have a view. Um, it's something I've been uh, trying to research on my own, but a lot by writing, doing mm-hmm. a lot of writing and seeing my own user experience and then uh, talking to um, folks that are closer to it. But I've been getting very different views from different people, so I haven't reached a conclusion yet. You um, you do support Measure A. I do. That would be the the measure that would make any development, housing development proposal in uh, unincorporated areas of the county that is not part of the general plan that already exists for where houses should go, that would make it so that uh, the entire county had to vote on that. Um, Do you think there are other parts of the county then, like incorporated areas that um, you do think should have more housing, like Encinitas? I think there are a lot of parts of the county that are incorporated that could have more housing. Um, we have, I was looking at this the other day, there's 161,000 units that were zoned to be built and um, under the existing county general plan. Yeah. Um, you know, I haven't looked at every single parcel, but I think the general, the basic framework that there was a general plan that uh, was, uh, resulted from a very intense uh, community-wide a set of negotiations and deliberations and consultations. And within the contours of the general plan, there are sufficient uh, units and parcels zoned to meet our housing needs. And those are not being built is very important to note because my view is that we should be building in places that are denser and not in places that are far, far, far flung. Um, and that's what the County general plan uh, put us on a path towards. Mm. And, what do you think of your your um, Democratic rival in the race, uh, Olga Diaz? She's very nice. I mean, I think she's nice. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I don't think she's. Um, you know, I I think we're we're looking at uh, the the eighth largest metropolitan region in the country. It's a six point three billion dollar budget. Um, we're the border with Mexico. You know, just essentially, need, we need to have a foreign policy that looks at trade, that looks at how we deal with um, the Mexican government, that you know thinks regionally. Um, I don't think she brings the experience that's required uh, to do the job, um, but I think she's a nice person. As in, like more global thinking. Um, I think we're talking. I mean, the the budget of the of the city of Escondido is you know two hundred million, right? Mm-hmm. The budget of the city of San Diego is four point three billion. Mm-hmm. Uh, the budget of the of the county is six point three billion. I mean, there's just order. And you would point to your own work and treasury and other. Yeah, and I mean, I worked with the World Bank and working with a lot of different countries um, on their own investment strategies and, and in helping them think about a lot of these same issues. Um, so you know, I think again, I don't want to say I don't really think much negative to say about her, but I think that to me, we stand. At a, at a crisis, frankly, globally, uh, with climate change, uh, with Trump in the White House. Um, and if we want to build the kind of community that I want to live in, that I want to raise my children in, we need strong leadership that can stand up to the Trump agenda, that can make San Diego a blue beacon for the kind of policies that we want to see enacted in our community that can help lead other counties, that can help lead the rest of the country, and that we don't have to wait for Sacramento to act. We don't have to wait for Washington to act. We in San Diego can can be that blue beacon, can be that that leading light, can um, can lead the fight. And I think that's what I bring, um, you know, both in terms of my breadth and depth of experience, uh, but also in terms of my like lifelong track record of frankly, biting off really big challenges and um, and succeeding. And that is what I think we need. And I uh, don't think there's any other candidate in the race who can bring that. There is a, a kind of an interesting divide on the left between your camps and her camps. And um, it is, it's it provoked uh, some of the elders of the party, I guess, to put out a, a letter saying that after the primary, you guys will get together and pledge support for each other. Why was that necessary, do you think? 
I would not characterize that letter as from the elders of the party, but <laughs> I am very. I didn't know how to describe. What would you call them? Uh, interested parties. Interested parties. Okay. Lovely people. I like them all very much. So to be clear, it was uh, the chairman of the Democratic Party, Will Rodriguez Kennedy, the um, secretary, executive secretary of the Labor Council, um, Keith Maddox, and it was Nathan Fletcher, the county supervisor. Yeah. You would hope to join. Yep. I mean, I'll be very clear. From day one, I've said the number one goal is to flip the county from red to blue. Yeah. Um, that we need to take on Gaspar. It's why I'm running. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, you know, some of my concerns about uh, other folks in this race is I feel like they haven't been as as focused on um, on countering Gaspar as I think that we need to be. Um, as in too friendly, perhaps? Uh, too friendly, Yeah. Uh, I think she's 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 Trump in San Diego, and um, the kind of leadership I think I'm we need is someone who can fight that and not cozy up to it. And so I'm from day one. I've said I'm committed to uh, fighting to flip the third, no matter what the outcome of the primary. Um, so I'm I'm glad that others have also uh, decided to to echo that. Uh- Nathan Fletcher, the, the, on the board, he's supported a lot of. Um, he's made a lot of interesting policy pr- uh, proposals. He's tried to direct a lot of the rhetoric. Do you have any uh, um, criticisms about how he's done things there, or any any um, ways that you would act differently or or lead differently if you were to get on the board? I think Nathan's doing a good job. I think it's hard to be one uh, mm-hmm. by yourself. Um, I do think I bring a lot of um, experience on the economic side that he's missing, and I can be a good complement to that and experience on the legal side that he's missing. So, I, you know, I imagine I'll be able to take a lot of leadership on issues around climate change, um, those kinds of uh, issues around affordable housing, these like very complicated, deep structural questions that, you know, frankly are hard. They're tough. They're naughty problems. And, you know, he he doesn't have the time to, you know, dive deep into all these things. And that's that those are things that I can bring and expertise. And I think we'll be a good team um, working together. Do you think that the employees at the county are properly compensated or need to be um, that needs to be addressed differently? Absolutely. I mean, 100 percent. You know, one of the reasons uh, that I was inspired to to step forward to run was because I was working closely with many county employees in the work to flip the 49th. And I got to know uh, in great detail um, how hard they work to do their jobs and how um, impeded they are in their ability to do their jobs by failure of county leadership, that they are so severely understaffed um, that there's been no equity study uh, done um, in many years. So as in pay rates between different types different, of employees, uh, between different counties. Oh, okay. To ensure that that we're adequately compensating our employees, uh, the understaffing issue. You know, of course, it's a quality of life for the employees, and they're oh, like very, very overworked. But also, they care deeply about their jobs. You know, they, they, these are dedicated, hardworking people, um, and they're. It's heartbreaking that they can't serve the communities that they're meant to serve because there's not enough people to do the job. They don't have the the time to go and do the outreach to find out who is eligible for CalWORKs and CalFresh and county services. They they literally don't have the time to do that. So then all of us in San Diego suffer. We, we our community suffers because we leave money on the table that we could be getting from Washington and from Sacramento and investing in our local economy at not – in addition to ensuring that people have you know, food to eat and some sort of basic social safety net. And we're not doing that basic work uh, because our county employees are so understaffed that they don't have time to do the outreach that they need. And it, this is, it just runs the gamut. So um, I have huge respect and for our county employees, and I'm really proud to have earned their endorsement um, because I, I think that they're going to be my boss well, you pushed back a couple of times on the word politics or political. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm most prominent in my mind is your, your father, Larry Bremer. He's a well-known local political consultant. What, is there something about politics that is mm, uh, not ideal or pejorative? It's not pejorative, but to me, the work that I think of as my life's work, and certainly that I think of as my father's life's work, is about 
uh, social change and that politics is one way that you can drive forward social change and one way you can uh, engage in public service in one way that we can serve our communities, but it's not the only way. It's certainly not an end goal in itself. You know, my, for me, it's funny. People say, you think of my dad as a political consultant. For me, he's a, an investigative journalist because I grew up when I, most of my life, he owned a little paper mm-hmm. called Newsline, um, you know, investigating Pete Wilson and uh, digging up some of the, you know, various stories around, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you call it, corruption or whatnot, but it was really, he was a, it was a journalist. Um, and I likewise have always been dedicated to public service, but never believed that running for politics is necessarily the best or the only way to make a contribution. Um, in fact, I think a lot of times you have politicians who, uh, jump in front of a train or a parade that's already going in some direction. And then they're well, look at me. I'm leading the parade or I'm leading the, the leading the charge. And having been the one who's been the behind the scenes doing a lot of the, the quiet work to create that parade, I, I it's a little bit a little bit insulting to think that the only way to create change or the only kind of leadership that we have are um, elected officials. I actually think some of the my heroes, uh, some of the best leaders are people who serve their communities in many other ways, environmental litigators, uh, community organizers, union organizers, uh, human rights activists, uh, people. There's just so many ways in which you can bring your skills and abilities to serve our community. And I, for my whole life, have always thought about how do I take the particular tool that I am with the specific set of experiences and skills that I have to best serve my community. And it's not ever been politics because I think there are so many ways that we can serve. And it is politics now because I see the great need and the great opportunity in San Diego to help San Diego, uh, my hometown that I love desperately, um, go in a in a more positive direction. Go in the direction that I think that it needs to go in. And I think I'm the person who's best ex- equipped with the best experience, with the best skills to do that work. Um, but I definitely do believe that we need to celebrate all the people who who put public service at the core of their lives, and it doesn't look like politics. Hmm. Well, Tara Lawson Reamer, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this Voice of San Diego podcast bonus episode. You can keep up with all of our political coverage with the Politics Report. That comes out every Saturday. It's an email report, email newsletter. Get that at vosd.org slash newsletters. I'm Scott Lewis, CEO and Editor-in-Chief. This show is produced by Nate John, Megan Wood, and Adriana Heldes, and it's recorded in the Voice of San Diego podcast studio, the most popular place to record podcasts in downtown San Diego. And this studio is made possible. It's sponsored by the Bob Nelson Charitable Fund. Thank you, Bob Nelson Charitable Fund. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.